Hey guys, so my guest today is Dr. Benjamin Hardy. In case you don't know him, Ben is currently the number one writer in the world on the platform medium.com. Ben blogs about topics of self-development and psychology, and I think he's really someone who walks the talk. So, and you can, you will hear this multiple times in this episode. So for instance, Ben shares his story of how he went from having zero knowledge, knowing nothing about blogging, writing articles, writing headlines, distributing it, to someone who closed multiple six-figure contracts on his books that he published. And then he also shares his story, and this is a good one, how he became someone who had zero kids in January to someone who had five kids in December the same year. So enjoy. So I want to dive right in, in dive right in on your in your blogging career. So right now, from from what I've read, you have four hundred thousand blog subscribers without paid advertising, which is a, which is four hundred email subscribers. Yes, four hundred thousand. Yes, yeah, 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 email subscribers. I read your book about blogging and and the advice you gave the, the the beginning bloggers, and I loved the story you shared in the beginning, how you went to a coach who told you that your goal was literally impossible. To, to achieve and then in within a few months you literally at least quadrupled i think like the, the, your original target can you talk about this how this happened and how how this how this story un, unfolds yeah there's a lot of good stuff in here uh for anyone who's wanting to be a writer or an entrepreneur or a creative of some sort so i decided back in early 2015 that I was ready to start blogging online and start building a career. Now, one thing you have to know is I had a very specific goal, and I think that that's very important. My goal was to get a six-figure book contract. I wanted to become a professional writer. Now, that doesn't have to be your goal. There's a lot of reasons to blog uh, or create online content, and it doesn't have to specifically be to be a, get a book contract. But for me, that goal gave me a purpose, and it gave me... Um, it kind of filtered my process. So there's a lot of writers out there or a lot of creators who are focused on the process. They're like, let's just crank out as many blog posts as we can and we'll just see where it takes us. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of good that can come from that. It can allow you to enjoy writing without worrying about metrics. But for me, I was very focused on a result. I was very focused on, I want to get a six figure book deal. And so how do I do that? And so basically I learned how to do it. I learned that in order for me to get a six figure book deal with one of the big major publishers, which is what I want to do. That might not be your goal, but that was my goal. And in order to, I had to reverse engineer that. And so I, I, I learned that in order to get a six figure book deal, I needed at least 100,000 email subscribers. That's advice I got from really smart people, read it online. And so once I learned that I needed over 100,000 emails, then that was my next quest was, all right, how do I learn how to get 100,000 emails? So I took a blogging course from John Morrow. John Morrow is really great. He's got his guest blogger platform and I took his $197 course and it taught me how to write viral headlines and it taught me how to get my blogs posted onto places like Huffington Post, Forbes and stuff like that because that kind of stuff is good for credibility. That's really all it's good for is credibility. It's not like you're gonna get page views or anything like that. Um, but at this time I was just educating myself. I was learning from people like, Jeff Goins, Mike, Michael Hyatt, Seth Godin, Ryan Holiday, uh, you know, John Morrow. I was just learning from all sorts of sources because I decided I wanted to become a professional blogger. Or so not, I did not want to be a professional blogger. I wanted to be a professional writer, author. And um, blogging was the path to doing that. And so at this point or around this point in early 2015, when I was asking all these questions and trying to get answers so that I could create a path toward my goal, I called a lot of literary agents. Agents are people who help people get book deals. And I told them that I wanted to get a book deal and I asked them, how can I do that? I was looking for coaching or guidance. And they all you know, asked me where I was at. And at the time I didn't have any email subscribers. I didn't even have a website and I, I wasn't really anywhere. And I didn't know how to do it. I was just asking questions. And basically their, their advice to me was like, it's going to take, they said, first off, they were all like, it's probably going to take you five years at least to get where you want to go. 
Like you're, you're just starting your, it will take you at least five years, maybe 10. <laughs> and, and they also, they gave me different answers. So rather than a hundred thousand emails, their answers were more like, you need like 20,000 emails or like 10 to 20,000 email subscribers. But they weren't looking, they weren't expecting me to get a six figure book deal. They were just saying you need about 10 or 20,000 emails to get a book deal. So, and they said it would take me at least five years to do that. And so that was for me, not the advice I was looking for. I, and so I, I was like, well, I need to figure out a way to do this in like two or three years. Cause I was just my motivation. And so that's when, yeah, that's when I just really started to learn how to write viral stuff, how to get lots of email subscribers. Uh, and that's when I started utilizing platforms like medium.com and stuff like that. And then, then I just started writing a lot. I started writing a lot and utilizing skills um, to start getting my blogs viewed by millions of people and starting to collect lots of emails fast. So I, I, just a quick thought and then I'll end and let you, uh, you know, we'll go back and forth. But if you don't have a clear goal, then you're not going to be able to know what to do. Um, so that's a thought. I see. How, how do you set a goal of this size when you're in a complete beginning and, and it seems so far in the distance that it can be hard to believe that it's actually achievable? Because when you don't know how to write the viral, viral articles, you don't know how to do like any of this stuff, and you make yourself a goal of a six-figure book contract, which is completely beyond the horizon, how do you make it so real that you can actually believe it all the time? Uh, to me, it was specific and simple enough that I could believe it. I didn't know how to do it, and I don't think you need to know how. I didn't know I needed to write viral blog posts. I didn't even know I needed to blog. I had no goal of blogging. I just said, I want to be a professional author, and I want to make a living doing that. And I, figure, and I learned that you could make 100, you know, 100,000 or a few hundred thousand dollars getting a book contract. And so I just thought, I don't know how long it's going to take me, but I want to learn how to get a book contract. And I want to learn how to provide for myself and for my family. And so then I started asking questions, people like Jeff Goins and getting on the phone and emailing them. It's like, and asking them how much, you know, how do I get a book deal, you know, where I can make over a hundred thousand dollars, just asking the question. And they would say, well, you need at least, you know, 50 or a hundred thousand email subscribers and you need to have a platform. And so it was just asking the questions. Uh, I could have set the goal to just get a book deal, even if it was, for $5,000 just so that I could be a published author. But that's where getting good information comes in. I actually was on the phone with Jeff Goins. At the time, I had 10,000 email subscribers. And I said, Jeff, should I get a book deal? And he's like, you could, but if he said, the most you could probably get right now is like 10 or $20,000 for that book deal because you're a first time author. He said, if you wait a full year and if you find a way to get up to 100,000 email subscribers, you can get maybe 200 or $500,000. So just wait the year. Um, so it's about getting good advice. Good, good advice and clarity is how you set correct goals, clear goals. Um, and so, but once you have a clear goal, then you can start to figure out the process. So for example, if, if, if you want to, in my case, if I didn't want to get a six figure book deal, but I, if I just wanted a book deal, I could have actually done that without a, without any subscribers, you can actually pay people to give you a book deal. <laughs> you can, and so like, but, but you have to be specific about what you want because what you want then determines how you get there. And so once I was like, well, I actually want a real one. I want a publish, I want one of the big publishers and I want a real book deal and I want to make a, hundred, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Because that was my goal, then I had to learn how to write viral blog posts. If that wasn't my goal, then I would have never needed to learn how to write viral blog posts. But because my goal was clear and pretty big, I needed to learn how to get really good at creating a big audience and getting lots of email subscribers. So um, having a specific goal helps you determine how, how to get there. I see. Did you have any moments when you had the really heavy writer's block that, that it was really difficult to overcome, you know, the, the, the mental fog and inability to focus to come with the inspiration? hundred percent. Yeah, I think I, I, I did a lot and I still do. I'm actually publishing two books this year. <laughs> so in June, I'm coming out with Personality Isn't Permanent. And in October, I'm coming out with a book called Who Not How, uh, which is a co-authored book between me and Dan Sullivan. But I had about almost a year of writer's block writing Personality Isn't Permanent. It was very difficult. And I had about two months just barely of writer's block writing Who Not How. Um, 
But writer's block, to be honest with you, is not, it doesn't mean that you, you're stuck. It, it just means that you're, uh, in, in other words, writer's block is self-inflicted. You can get, you can, you can overcome writer's block very fast. Um, when it comes to blogging for my first year or more, I didn't really get stuck writing because I was always journaling and I would just come up with topics, headlines, topics, and I would just write first thing in the morning before I started looking at my social media. And I'm doing that now. And, and my writing is getting a lot better again because I'm, I'm writing first thing in the morning before I start looking at social media, before I look at email. So there are ways and strategies. You know, one of the things that really helped me, for example, was um, especially with blogging, just writing and, and, and having a deadline that I would be publishing an article before 8 a.m. Just so that, and I'd wake up at like five in the morning and I'd organize an outline and then I would write. And I just knew that I would push publish in a couple hours, whether it was good or bad. You know, one of my, one of my favorite quotes is better prolific than perfect. It's better to be prolific than perfect. And so uh, I think just getting used to publishing, getting used to pushing publish, um, and just constantly keeping a notebook on you where you're taking ideas and then just getting better and better at taking a small idea or a kernel of an idea and just seeing how fast you can expand it. Um, but uh, as far as my bigger projects, like these books, the reason I got writer's block is because I didn't have an, a good accountability system and I didn't have a good feedback system. The reason why writers get stuck in their head is because they're not either sharing their ideas or they're not being required to um, have something complete. That's why blogging is so great is because you can just push publish. And with a book, you can't just push publish. With a book, it's such a big project that it's easy to get stuck in the weeds. But I've found that I go a lot faster if on a weekly basis I have to present something to like my editor. So it's good to have deadlines often and then, um, you know, to get feedback. Like if you're doing something big, it's good to have someone to talk to about your ideas. It's bad to be just in your head. That's really bad for creativity. So if you, if you can have someone that you like talking to, that helps you to kind of understand and flesh out your ideas. And then if you have regular follow-up or feedback situations or accountability systems, then you don't necessarily need to, to deal with writer's block. One last thought is just in your head already, you know so much. Your problem is, is that you're not confident about what you don't. You're not confident enough in what you know. You know a lot. And a lot of people who may be listening to this, they know enough where if you just got out of your own way, you could just write. And you could write a lot if you weren't so worried about what other people thought about it or if you weren't worried about how it sounded. Um, you have a lot of, you have more information and knowledge than you, than you need. Um, you, what you need to do is learn how to structure it so that you can just, you know, and for me, that's, that's the key is if you can just create a, a headline, could be anything, you know, whatever it is you're, you want to write about, could be about having a morning routine. It could be about having a six pack. It could be about ha having a podcast. It could be about finding a date. You just, whatever the headline is and whatever the topic is, and then you say, well, what are the four or five key, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm writing a, an article about dating, what are the four things or five things that matter? You know, like deciding what kind of girl you want to date, deciding how to find her, whatever, you know, and then you just, you create a short outline and then you just literally write it and get out of your own way and just write everything you know, write in the tone or in the aggressiveness or in the way that you want to, and then just push publish. And just get better and better at just getting comfortable throwing your ideas out there and not worrying so much about what people think and learning to be more and more honest and writing in the way that you want to, saying it in the way you want to, you know? So, if, so one of the things you'd want to think about if you were writing an article about like starting a business is, all right, well, how does that, how do I want this thing to sound? Do I want this to punch people in the face? And like, do I want this to like motivate people and like call them out or do I, like, how do I want this to sound? How do I want this to feel when someone's reading it? Uh, thinking in those terms. I see. Yeah, it's literally, as you said, that we all put these self-inflicted blocks on ourselves. And it's literally the same with dating or, or, or business. Because that's what I teach when it, comes to, when it comes to dating, for instance, that the only thing you need to do is just to be authentic and just, just tell the truth all the time. And it's the same thing, it's the same thing with writing. And... Yeah, so, so do, you, do you sometimes just start with the headline, actually, and then create the whole article according to the headline? Yeah, that's the best way to do it. You want to start with the headline. I the see. headline is the idea. 
-hmm. So for example, a thought that I've been having lately is that all behavior is addictive. So if I, if I drink water, that will make me want to drink more water. If I eat candy, that will make me want to eat more candy. If I listen to podcasts, that will make me want to listen to more podcasts. This is just a thought that's been in my head. It's the thought that every behavior is addictive. If I, if I go to the gym, I'll want to go to the gym more. If I go running, I'll want to run more. If I watch TV, I want to watch TV more, right? This is just a thought. And so you have lots of thoughts in your head as well. And so now it's like, well, how do I turn this thought into an article? And how do I turn that article into a useful article? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I would start with the headline. It's like, I could call it all behaviors addictive. I could, you know, but that article wouldn't get clicked very much, you know? So I'm like, well, how would I, how could I turn this into something that could potentially be viral? Uh, and I could say something like, you know, this fact about human nature, you know, could help you become whoever you want to be. I mean, I could just figure out whatever I want to call it, but then the whole article would be about how all behavior is addictive and about how if you, if you want to become a certain person, you want to choose the type of behaviors that you want to get addicted to. Um, that's just one thought. But like you want to start with the idea and then form it into a, a headline that then guides the structure and the outline. And then you just write. And then you just say what you want to say um, and try to be useful. <laughs> like, I see, I see. Does it ever happen to you that people are complaining about your headlines being too overpromising? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what people say about my headlines. Uh, the only thing I care about is that people click on them and that when people get on the inside, the article blows their mind, the right people. I'm not worried about anyone who's outside of my audience. The only people I'm trying to write for and the people I'm trying to help are the people who want that specific information. That's one of the things that I learned from Seth Godin is that he said, anyone who is outside of your target audience, their opinion doesn't matter. But also, if you're not good at headlines and if you're not getting people to getting people to get on the inside to click, that doesn't matter how good your content is. No one's going to read it. And so you have to get good. At, you know, one of the things that Ryan Holiday said that I again learned when I was first blogging is he said that your headline should dare people to click on it. It should be so bold that it's daring people to look and find out what's on the inside. Now that could sound like clickbait, but it's also good marketing. And so. My, how I came to terms with it when I was blogging was is that I want to create the most compelling headline so that people click. And then when people get on the inside, I want to over deliver on my promise. I want, I want it to be mind blowing. I want the quality of the content to be so good that it's above and beyond even what they were expecting. Yeah. My experience with your articles, to be honest, is that I, one day I started to receive your newsletter and I have no idea. I don't remember clicking on, on like on Ben Hardy subscribe. But you I must have gotten my seven page checklist, my morning routine checklist or something like that. It's very likely. It's very likely, but this was a long time ago. I think it was like 2017, maybe 16. Sure. And I just remember I opened it and I saw the headline and I was just like, okay, I, okay I'm, I'm, I'm not reading this. And then I started to read them and I literally don't know where you, where you came from. But the, the, as I started to re read those articles, they were intriguing, a lot of them. And I, and then I fell in love with the book Sleepstream Time Hacking. Oh, nice. And I'm a kind of like a, a technical conceptual guy. So taking psychology and putting it into, into like uh, quantum physics and, and time to me, like I, I remember I was in a, I was sitting in a technical training for alarm systems, which was the company I was working for back then. And I don't, I have no idea what the training was about because all I was doing was reading the book on my, on my phone. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Slipstream time hacking is a totally different style of a book. You know, it's a crazy book. Uh, it's fun though. It's uh, to me, to me that, that, that book, why I like that book was cause it was pure play. Like I was, I didn't, I mean, I thought it was fascinating the ideas, but it was, to me, it was just play. I was stretching the ideas. And so like one of the things that I, that I'm okay with is that I don't necessarily see anything I write as a hundred percent concrete fact. Uh, I don't even, I don't think that any form of nonfiction is purely factual. Like even history is subjective. Um, my own view is my opinion. And so like with slipstream time hacking, I can stretch the ideas as much as I want, even though it's technically nonfiction, I can stretch my ideas because for me it's creativity and whether or not people think I'm delusional or crazy, doesn't really matter. It's my, it's my opinion. I'm an author, I'm a creator. And so I don't need to believe that my ideas have to be concrete facts. 
they're my own opinion and also they're me stretching and playing with ideas. And so it allows me more creative, more creativity. And, and some people will read my stuff and say, this guy is totally nuts. He totally is like this guy. He's so unrealistic and ridiculous. There's no way that anything he's saying is possible. Like he's, he's giving bad advice because nothing he says is possible. He's delusional. Um, and for me, I'm just as fascinated by ideas as I am about the execution of those ideas. I like just playing with ideas. I like spirituality. I like psychology. I like physics. I, I like just seeing how far I can stretch the ideas. So for me, it's more about the fun and thoughtfulness of it rather than how true it is. Even though I love truth as well. I'm, I seek truth and stuff like that. But with Slipstream Time Hacking, that book was more about how much can I stretch my own thinking. Yeah, it was like it was like acrobatics, I would say, like a mental acrobatics, like something like this. And it like it made like it all made sense. I wouldn't say that there is some like bullshit idea that like that just made the whole thing burn. It all made sense. Like if you make the effort to go there, it's gonna it's gonna click in. <laughs> That's the fascinating yeah, thing. Yeah, it's it, every time I read that book, even myself, because I'll go back to it. I wrote it back in early 2015, right before I started blogging. Every time I go back and read it, I'm like, I, I start to feel that mind stretch. And that's actually what I like. That's what I like in books is, you know, uh, how can you stretch your thinking? You know, I actually recently got that. Like when I was listening to uh, Peter Diamandis' new book, The Future is Faster Than You Think. Yeah, obviously, there's not as much stretch, but like there was some ideas in there that I was like, these are so different. And it was just fun. Yeah. It seems like you have a low level of defensiveness from social disapproval or i uh, like it, it's easy for you to process if, if someone if someone disapproves you socially which is something that i think a lot of people struggle with and i mean i i still struggle with it to a certain level is this something that you had through upbringing and through your parents or you somehow learned to do that through through, through psychology or can you talk about this yeah to me and this kind of goes into personality isn't permanent to be fully honest with you um it has to do with confidence. It has to do with confidence and being flexible. And those are totally learnable skills. Um, so the more clear you get on who you want to be and on what you want for your life, the more, first off, you realize how, how limited time is. Speaking of slipstream time hacking, like time is too short once you're, once you're clear on what you want to worry about people on the internet's opinions. Like literally, most of the people who you look up to or that I look up to on the internet have very normal lives outside of their internet persona. Like, I mean, yeah, they've got cool things. They may spend time with interesting people and have interesting conversations, but like at the end of the day, they live in a house, they eat food, like their personality and even who they are is pretty normal in their, in their situation. Like I go home and I'm just a dad of, I am a dad of five kids, but like, I'm not some crazy motivational guy 24 seven. Like I have crazy big ideas and I'm excited <laughs> about those ideas. But when I'm at home and a dad, I'm just sitting there on the couch hanging out with my kids. Like, and anyone you look up to for the most part is just a normal human being. Um, yeah, you can have big dreams and you can stretch into those and you can become that. But I think that, you know, step one is like, you know, first off, most of the people whose opinions you're worried about You'll never meet them. They don't matter. Um, and so that's part of it. But I, yeah, I have gotten to the point. And I think, uh, I think you get to the point more and more where, and again, it's like all behavior is addictive. You get to the point where you just stop caring. Like, you, you know, I, for a long time, I was always worried about what people thought about my blog posts when I first writing, started writing them. Because like, at that point in my life, you know, when I, about early 2015, 16, 17, I was... Uh, you know, first just getting into my PhD program. Uh, I didn't, I, I, I was really motivated, very excited. And I think you could feel that in my writing. Um, and I was a little worried, honestly, to share that with people because I'm like, man, like maybe people don't realize that this is how I think or like this is how I feel and this is how like excited I am about life. Like I thought I was mostly worried about um, like people from like my high school or like my family and my friends. Like if they saw my post and they're like, why is Ben like being such like, a motivational guy? Um, <laughs> and so that's I was worried about that. I was, I was more worried about those people than like what the internet thought about me. Um, but now, like four or five years later, at this point, like 
I really don't care about like even like what, what would my in-laws think of me like my in-laws love me like my parents-in-law and stuff um but this i think it, this comes with aging as well that like the more you get older the more you realize like other people's opinions doesn't matter and you get to choose who you become and everyone's choosing who they become like now i've been out of high school for like over 10 years and so like most of the people in my high school are choosing to become who they're becoming and uh I don't judge them for that. Like they are they're they can become whoever they want to be. And like, this is just who I'm choosing to be. And so you just stop caring as much. I see. I want to, I want to switch into, into this topic that you already started a bit with, with, with children. So was it, I think it was 2018 when you grow, where, when you grew your family from zero to, from two to seven, right? How did this idea came or like, like how, how did this happen? Because I only have four kids, and anytime I talk about this with, with someone, like, like it needs to be gradual. You have four kids? No, I want to have four kids one day. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, cool. That's cool. But the way I always imagine it with it is that I'll, I'll have first, I'll learn how things go, then I have the second, so that I get, you know, I'm, I really, I'm more, more comfortable around the, around the stuff, and then comes the third and fourth. But you, like, you did the whole thing in a few months, right? So, <laughs> where did, I mean, how, you've, read did you've, you've, you've read Slipstream Time Hacking. Have you ever read Willpower Doesn't Work? Not yet. Okay, that's fine. That book explains a lot of kind of philosophy behind how and why I do that. Slipstream time hacking explains the notion of wormholes, right? And about how you can jump from one spot to another really fast, right? Um, so when just using, and again, a lot of people listening to this have never heard of that book, <laughs> but in that book i talk about how like so wormholes are the idea that you can jump from one place in space to another spot instantaneously uh, it's kind of like a shortcut through space um and when you do that when you or when you go through like light speed you know like i'm talking again like sci-fi it's it's jarring it's intense it's not the normal way to do it like it's not like a slow path you know like when you jump through something and make a lot of progress in a short amount of time it's emotionally difficult it's traumatizing it's intense and so you have to be willing to put yourself through a lot of emotional trauma if you want to do stuff like that so just as an example so my wife and i when it was actually in 2015 we became foster parents of three kids and none, you know we had never been parents before these were three siblings and over from 2015 to 2018 we fought the legal system to try to adopt those three kids and it was in 2018 in february that we were able to adopt those three kids and then one month later my wife got pregnant with twins you know, so they were born in December of 2018 and we adopted the kids in February of 2018. So in 2018, we did officially go from zero kids to five kids. Um, but when we first became foster parents, we took on three kids from a troubled background all at once, not just one at a time, but it was like, we've never been parents before. We're both graduate students. Let's take on three kids from a troubled background all at once, ages three, five, and seven. Now, the reason one of the things i talk about big and willpower doesn't work is how flexible and I, and i talk about this to some degree in personalities and permanent but how flexible and adaptable human beings are and that you know this is a lot of research in psychology but we adapt to our situations so there's a quote from will durant and he said that the ability of the average person could be doubled if their situation demanded it and so most people they fall to the demands of their situation you know, if you had a kid, even though, if it would, even though it would be stressful, you would figure out how to adapt to it. It may that, take six yeah. months or a year if you had two kids. If I threw two kids at you right now, even with your current job and your goals, it would stress you out, and, and, but you would, you would force yourself to figure out how to make it work. Because I, I don't know how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put yourself into a situation of demand. You put yourself in a situation, in a lot of ways, I call it point of no return. Um, but uh, you put yourself in a situation where you're forced to figure it out. I actually call it forcing function in willpower doesn't work. I call it a forcing function. You create a situation that forces you to uh, perform and adapt to a certain level and to become a certain person. 
And we wanted that. So we were intentional. We said we want to take on three kids. We, we know that it's going to be intense. We know it's going to be crazy. We don't, we don't fully know what we're going to be required to do. But we want to become whatever that evolution becomes. We know that it's going to evolve us because we're going to have to learn how to be more patient. We're going to have to learn how to like love and support these kids. We're going to have to learn how to deal with their problems. We're going to learn how to manage the stress while at the same time me trying to be creative and writing books. What came out of it, honestly, is, is that it helped me actually become a professional writer because when I had the three kids, I now had this huge sense of responsibility placed on me that I didn't have before. All of a sudden, I'm like, holy cow, I've got these three kids that depend and rely on me. I need to get serious about this writing thing. And that's actually what kickstarted me to start writing on my blogs and stuff. And ultimately, it's a big contribution to why I was successful so fast is because I had to be kind of talking about like, it requ I was required to be like, from my perspective, I was required to be. So while there's a lot, of, there's millions of bloggers and millennials out there and stuff like that, and even Gen, you know, Zers, a lot of them are obviously successful, but none of them, you know, uh, many of them believe that they can get they can they can get there next year or in two or three or four years from now or five years and that there's not much rush and and there's no extreme pressure on them that was self-imposed pressure by the way to become to become successful or to achieve a certain goal for me i put that pressure on myself and i wanted it not not just to become a professional writer but because we believe in that kind of stuff you know yeah. a lot of it comes from our philosophy and our, our religious or our spiritual perspectives that we want to help and support other people so but the kind of crux idea of all of this is that anything that anything like you will adapt to your situation if i threw five kids at you it may be the most stressful and paralyzing one or two or three years of your life but in three years from now if you and i were to talk you'd be a different person yeah. And you would be able to handle the new situation and you would have figured out a lot. You'd be different. You, and it would be your new normal. You would be adjusted and adapted to the new slipstream or the new wormhole or the new environment or the new situation. You will adapt and adjust. And if you are a good learner and if you know how to emotionally regulate, which for me is through journaling and through, um, talking with key people and expressing my feelings rather than isolating myself mm. if you if you're a good learner then you can adjust much faster even to extreme demand and extreme pressure yeah to me it sounds like you need to have a lot of faith to have this level of of trust that you will adapt and nothing like you know, and the life is not going to collapse under your legs i think faith and confidence and courage those are three similar but separate things it you know faith yeah yeah you know, it could be whatever form of faith you're describing, whether it's kind of just faith that things can work out or literally faith in God and get on your knees and pray and get, mm. get additional resources and blessings. I think it's both, but it's also confidence, uh, internal confidence that's developed as you fail and watch yourself learn. You know, confidence is, is trust that you can handle stuff. It's trust and belief that you can do things. And so it's faith, it's confidence, it's courage, it's, it's external support. It's getting support from others, whether that be friends and family, uh, whether that be whatever other resources you can get, it's being resourceful and not just doing it all yourself. I mean, I couldn't have done it if I wasn't married to an amazing person. You know, she doesn't get a lot of credit, like when I'm talking in my blogs, but like I wouldn't be doing any of my stuff if my wife wasn't extremely capable enough to like raise five kids. Like she's capable, <laughs> like far more That's capable I, i'm not that I, i'm not i couldn't do this nor would i even want to or even attempt to if it wasn't for her like a lot of that was her idea which shows her own confidence but also her own goals and that i support those goals uh and that they become my goals as well and so it's not just you but it's your supporting cast it's yeah. uh it's who you bring around you and and uh the capability of those around you as well and the faith of those around you as well how old are you guys? I'm curious. Yeah, I just turned 32, actually, 32. Um, last month. Yeah, so I turned 32. Uh, I started blogging, I guess, when I was around like 26, 27. Okay. Can you elaborate on, the, on what's your definitions of, of uh, faith, confidence, and courage? And how do you see them relate to each other? Yeah, they're very different. I mean, they're, they're very connected and very different. Courage. So faith, um, faith obviously goes more into the spiritual aspects 
you know, and I will just say, I do believe in God, have a relationship with God. Um, and so for me, faith, faith can be separate from God as well. Like faith, faith can just be believing in a vision or believing in something that you don't see. Um, like just genuinely, but for me, faith is also like an inner knowing. It's like a knowing that things will work out or could work out. So like for me, just as an example, uh, this year I'm launching two books. Like I have complete faith that they're going to be successful, way more successful than anything I've ever done in the past. Like I have complete faith that my book personality isn't permanent is going to sell millions of copies. And when I say faith, it's that I know it's going to happen, even though it hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. So like it fit, you know, like the idea that I know the sun is going to rise. Like I don't have yeah. any, I don't know if the sun's going to rise tomorrow, but I know it's going to, you know, like, so that's, that's one form of faith. But a, 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 an additional expansion of that is, is that you can have faith in a being, whether that's your higher power, faith in physics, um, faith in something outside of you. So like for me, I have faith in a higher power and I ask that higher power to help me make things happen, whether that be wormholes, miracles, situations. So I could have faith in my goal and then I could ask God in this case to make things happen outside of my control. Please bless celebrities to find my book, you know, or big <laughs> podcasts or like, or that this podcast reaches the right audience and that it, and that great things come from that. So that's a kind of faith where it's like, it's a belief, it's a knowledge, it's a knowing um, in something that you can't tangibly see, but it's also, in my opinion, connected to, or it can be connected to a higher power. Um, As far as confidence. Can I, can I pause here for a second? Yeah. What, What are some of the beliefs that are supporting that something like this is actually possible and it works? Because I believe that when it comes to, when it, even when it comes to spirituality and faith, it's still based on the basic psychology and the logic of, or if I have a firm belief, which somehow fits within my logic, then all these things can, this is something that makes all these things possible. So when it comes to like, like believing in God and believing that, that if you wish for something, he, he or she or they can support you, in this and that you have therefore support and it is going to happen because it seems like we have this unshakable certainty. So, so what's the, what are some of the beliefs that are supporting this? Yeah. So, you know, this is an idea in philosophy, but there's a concept in philosophy that, and it's, it's, um, I would have to look it up. I just barely recently heard this, even though I've, I've studied it in depthly, but we, I think it's metaphysics. Met, metaphysics is essentially the idea of what you believe is reality. You have a belief about the nature of reality, and I have a, a belief about the nature of reality. Your belief about the nature of reality may be that, you know, there is no God, which if that's the case, that's totally fine. We all have our own views. Um, and we all, be- we all develop our own philosophy or worldview or underlying assumptions and beliefs about what is true and what is real and how the, how the nature of the universe works. A lot of that knowledge you can get through science, religion, philosophy, uh, education, experience. Um, But we all develop our own fundamental philosophy about how things work. And that leads us to shaping our goals, uh, our identity, our choices, et cetera. Um, So for me, I've had lots of experiences. When I was a 20-year-old kid, you know, I left a really brutal, terrible environment and I served a church mission and had a lot of powerful experiences. And I usually, to be honest with you, this is, I'm generally not that explicit about my my faith and my perspectives we're just you're just asking me and i'm just gonna carry the conversation wherever you want to go but uh yeah i had very powerful experiences and those experiences and then my uh my own testing of of the ideas whether it be prayer journaling service um looking for the good in the world i test the ideas just like anyone tests their assumptions um and I also study science. I mean, I, I don't believe that religion or spirituality are the only places to get truth. I, I love psychology as an example. I love science. I believe in just looking for, for truth. And that's truth as, you know, filtered the best I can. Um, but I look at the evidences in my own life, you know, and, and I see a lot of at least evidence from my perspective that the ideas that I'm using are at least working for me. Um, that doesn't mean I'm testing all these ideas right. Uh, and, and I certainly see them wrong. I mean, one of the big things I talk about in personality isn't permanent is the idea that you shouldn't overly value your own perspective because hopefully your perspective in the future is a lot better than it is right now. You know, I talk a lot in that book about your future self and about 
who your future self is. What is their situation? What are the, you know, how much wisdom do they have? Like, what are they up to? What are they, what do they care about? And hopefully your future self is the evolved version of your current self. And if that's the case, then your current views and your current perspectives and even, even your current persona are limited. And so uh, you shouldn't overly attach to and value your current identity and even your own current ideas. Hopefully they get replaced and, and evolved into better ideas. Um, but I'm just always searching, you know, but, but the, the unshakable faith component that you're talking about, um, that comes from a few things, you know, that comes from one actually genuinely having, from my perspective, a connection with, in my opinion, God, like, I believe that it's not like, I'm not just talking to nothing. Like when I talk to God, like, I feel like I receive answers and like that it, 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 it like, so for me, even if it's just purely in my head, which I don't believe it is. I, I, I've developed an ability to relate to this being and to be guided by or to make decisions and to get supported by and helped by. So for me, it's, 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 it's not as ethereal or as like, it's not like, I, I don't feel like I'm speaking to emptiness, you know? So for me, I gain confidence the more I, I watch stuff like that happen. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a lot of Walter Russell. Have you heard of this guy? Who? Walter oh. Russell. No. It's like, I think he lived like a, uh, like 120 years ago. And he is, like some, some people call him like the most accomplished man of the 20th century. Because he was one of the, like he was very well known sculptor, painter. Oh, is this the writer. book Tapping, Tapping the Universe or whatever? Yeah, Man Who Tapped the Secrets of the Universe. Oh, yeah. So I, have, I, have, I actually have read that book. I read that book quite a few years ago. Yeah. And he says the same thing that he, that once he decides to do something, he's imagining it happening and he believes that this is his future self. And he has an unshakable confidence that anytime he thinks and he believes he can do that, there's a massive force and power that's supporting him in, in, in doing that. And he says that anyone can achieve anything this way. Uh, I don't know if I'm as extreme as, as that, but I'm close a hundred percent. Um, I, I believe that uh, we're all incredibly limited by our goals and by our, by our ambitions and that, you know, that, so it, you, you get, you get, and I, but I think you have to build confidence and you build that faith. I mean, so he built up to that level after doing so many things in the beginning, he, he had faith, but over time, as he became a professional sculptor, a musician or author, as he became an inventor, as he did all these things, his belief or his trust or his ability to do that stuff increased. And so it was both faith and confidence. Um, and, I, and I've gotten there to some degrees. Um, like I've watched myself as an example, set the goal to get a six figure book deal or to have my blog reach tens of millions of people. And I've watched myself do it. And so when you watch yourself do it, then you're like, okay, like there's something to this. Maybe I can do more or bigger or different. And so you try to expand that. And, uh, it takes courage and it and obviously your subconscious will try to block you even even after you've gained confidence you're going to try to stay where you're at and so it, it always takes courage and faith to get up to the next level but you get better and better at taking bigger leaps and making firmer decisions you know as he said whatever he decides to do he knows he can do you know obviously there's the quote you know whatever you know the universe whenever you make a decision the universe conspires with you. there's 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 aspects of that. i mean i actually address that pretty head on in personality isn't permanent about how to make decisions and about how to um how to shift your identity so that your identity matches the decisions you make and then how to formulate a subconscious an identity narrative an environment so that you become that person and it's it's all possible i mean i'm just telling you just as an example i've never sold millions of books but I can tell you, and this is a prediction, you can, you know, and, and maybe I'll be wrong, but personality isn't permanent. Like in a year from now, so in 2021, this book is going to be huge. Like, but I'm not just, I'm, just, I'm not just mystically watching it happen. Like I actually, in, in fact, had to fail enormously on my last book, Willpower Doesn't Work, in order to clarify and become emotionally committed to this goal. Um, and so like, this podcast interview is one out of like 400 I'm going to do this year. And I'm going to write a hundred new blog posts. Like 
this kind of goes back to the beginning of the conversation that the decision or the goal shapes the process. And if your goal is at a certain level, then the process is at a certain level. But if your goal is at, a, is at an extreme level, then your process needs to become extreme as well. And most people are not going to understand that. But like, because, because I'm pretty clear on a, on a massive goal, my process is going to be different. It's not going to look like me learning how to write viral articles that reach 10, 10 million people anymore. Because my goal for that no longer is is no longer relevant. Now it's like, okay, how do I sell ten million books? If my if my former goal was how do I get a six figure book deal, and you can reverse engineer that. Now my goal is how do I sell ten million books in two or three years, and then I figure that out. And then you exercise faith, courage, confidence, and you 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 figure things out. So what Russell what Walter Russell didn't say is that once he makes a decision he gets to work figuring it out and he gets help from a lot of people um, and he gets extremely committed in figuring out things. He learns a lot. He learns the process. He fails through it and he does a ton of stuff between himself and the achievement of his goal, but he's going to do it because he made the decision he's going to do it. He believes he's going to do it. And then he fuels that belief. Yeah. So, so now we talked about faith. Can you elaborate on the, the confidence and courage aspects? Absolutely. Uh, and just so you know, I got to bounce in five. <laughs> um, so okay. confidence is, they're very connected concepts. I think that they're all very connected concepts. Um, to be honest with you, faith might actually encompass both courage and confidence. Um, but confidence comes from courage. There's actually a really good book, and I recommend it. It's an ebook that anyone can download for free. It's called The Four C's Formula, I think, and it's from Dan Sullivan, and he talks about the four C's. He's, he talks about how it first starts with commitment. You've got to make a commitment. So like, you know, let's just say I'm committed to selling 10 million books or I'm committed to making a million bucks, whatever it is. You've got to commit to something and commitment leads to courage. So you've got to commit to something specific. You know, you've got to commit to a specific goal and true commitment means you're going to, to get there. Like, uh, it's not just like, I'm going to try. It's like, no, I'm doing this thing. Um, you commit to something. It could be just that I'm going to work out six days a week, but I would commit yeah. to an outcome. Don't commit to a process. Commit to an outcome. Because it takes actually a lot more faith to commit to an outcome. Um, and then, so you go from commitment to courage. It takes courage to actually start trying and acting and living as your future self or whatever the decision is. So courage is just being willing to try something that won't work. Courage involves taking risks. And so uh, if you're not trying something that could fail, then it's not courage. Courage involves no guarantees. So every time I posted a blog post, there was no guarantee I'd succeed. There's no guarantee I'm going to succeed at anything I'm trying because it involves faith. Like if you need, if you need absolute certainty, then there's no faith, you know, but you can be certain and secure in yourself, but at the same time you're taking, you're taking risks and you're trying stuff that could fall apart and fail. And that's part of the, part of the reason it takes faith. Um, so once you've exercised courage and you're out there trying and stuff, you develop the third C according to Dan Sullivan, which is capability. You start to get good at whatever it is you're trying. So if, you, if it's terrifying to do one of these interviews or if it's terrifying to write blog posts or to try something, eventually after you've done it a few times, you start to get decent at it. You start, you start to get some skill. And that capability creates confidence. So confidence is... It's kind of, uh, it's based on not only your belief of what's possible, but it's also based on your capability and what you've already accomplished, what you've done in the past. That's why it's powerful to watch yourself do things um, because that builds the confidence that you can keep going. I see. So, does, that, does that all make sense? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. So it's like a, it's like a side effect of all these effort, commitment, and the consistent way to, to get where you want to be. Confidence is totally a side effect. So is motivation etc. Those are side effects. There are things you can learn to control though, but they're side effects. Yeah. Okay. So before we wrap up, um, can you tell something about something about the, the, your, your book, The Personality Isn't Permanent? Something that, that did you, you find interesting that, that might be important for the readers to know before they get into it? Yes. 100%. Um, just because we're on this conversation, uh, and I'm not exactly sure given the situation when you're going to publish it, but 
one of the things I get, I'm giving away for people who pre-order personality isn't permanent is free access to what I have a genius blogging course. So I, I actually, a couple of years ago did a full day seminar at genius network, which is cost $25,000 to be there. I did a full day seminar there for like six hours on all of my blogging strategies, how to write headlines, how to structure the articles, how to get onto big platforms, how to, I even give away my book proposal for willpower doesn't work. And I've sold that thing for over a thousand dollars. I give that for free for anyone who wants or for anyone who pre-orders the book. Um, but I will just give one thought on personalities and permanent. It's too, too much to cover in this conversation. Most people, so mo most people's view of personality is totally limited. It's basically a fixed mindset, but the problem for most people is that they set their goals and their ambitions based on their personality, based on who they think that they are. So they set goals that they think fit them. Um, and it's a lot more powerful to, sh so rather than having your personality be the basis of your goals, which is how most people do it, I believe that your goals should be the basis of your personality. So whoever it is, whatever it is you aspire to do, you can be shaped and morphed and become that person. You can change your personality to match your goals rather than having goals fit your current limiting personality. And there's a lot of research about how personality changes. Um, there's a lot of, so there's, you know, there's four major things that contribute to your personality. One is trauma. There's traumatic experiences that you've had in the past that have shaped you to be who you are. There's your identity narrative, which is the story in your head about how you explain yourself. There's your subconscious and then there's your environment. And if you change those four things, you will change your personality. And personality is incredibly flexible. Um, but from my perspective, most people's personality is rigid. It's not flexible because of those four things. But if you get really good at those four things, you can become incredibly flexible with your identity and with your goals and your aspirations and your imagination. And you can shape yourself into who you want to be. And there's a lot of really cool science that I did. That book is actually the most scientifically backed book I've ever written. <laughs> there's hundreds of citations. There's a lot of good science behind how personality can be flexible. So that's that book. I see. So, okay. So where, where, where can guys uh, find you, follow you, or reach out, maybe pre-order the book? Yeah. So benjaminhardy.com is where people can find me. Uh, on, you know, if you go benjaminhardy.com forward slash personality, you can learn about the book. Uh, see a lot of blurbs uh, from people who have already read it. And if you pre-order the book on like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or something like that, and then email through my website, the receipt, we will send you Genius Blogging. Okay. Thank you so much, man, for this interview. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, and I hope you're you actually an amazing interviewer, man. You're brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, you're a brilliant interviewer. You're incredible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, man. Have a great day, Ben. You too, my man. It was awesome to talk to you.